it's a great uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much uh, to the organizers to bring the conference here right to the center of Washington. This is uh, fantastic. Uh, I will speak about uh, experiments in optical lattices with some special topology and I will report on the observation of quantized conductance in a neutral matter system. But let me briefly uh, introduce uh, quantum gases. So um, quantum gases, we have seen fantastic uh, research over the last 10, 20 years and sometimes I wonder is there still so much uh, to be discovered and will we be able uh, to see new phenomena? After all, we are looking at a system, at a gas in some container and at some stage we should be able uh, to understand how this gas in the container behaves. On the other hand, then, if I then think about electrons in a container, well, electrons in a solid, then I realize, well, electrons, you have seen many different phenomena over the last, I don't know, 50 or 100 years, and it doesn't really stop. Uh, so it seems that these quantum gases in a container are indeed a very rich system. For example, there are new proposals coming out, something like photovoltaic quantum Hall effect, whatever that is, but I will say a few more words uh, on that. On the other hand, we should also keep in mind that the quantum gases are a different system. I mean, in a solid, there the container is given by the material. You can do some nanostructuring uh, to it, in, and the, the interaction is basically given. In our case, we can change the interaction. We can build and structure our container and also in the future and, and increasingly also the reservoirs and the coupling uh, to the outside. And also it is a bit like that we start out with a Hamiltonian. We build the Hamiltonian and then we try uh, to access the physics, address open questions, fundamental concepts, maybe driven by beautiful systems or trying to find uh, new questions and insights. So what, where, where, where is the physics uh, in the quantum gas? The physics lies in the very low energy uh, sector. That's why if you do spectroscopy in the optical domain on quantum gases, it's very hard uh, to see anything unless you have such ultra high resolution uh, spectroscopy like Junier who starts to see many body effects in, in, in his precise clocks. Else it's usually you see just in the kilohertz uh, regime and you have to establish a detection for that. Typically this low energy regime is captured by a very generic Hamiltonian which has three parts, the kinetic energy, the interaction energy and the trapping potential. So the kinetic energy is of course just uh, describes the motion of the atoms, but already if you add a band structure, then you open up band gaps, you might have metallic or insulating phases, or you might have uh, Dirac points and have different topology, and we'll also look at a topo topology where you have only one Dirac point and the other gap, uh, the, other, the other Dirac point you have a, have a gap. You can also play with the internal degrees of freedom um, to give a to couple the inter different internal degrees of freedom and then you get something like spin orbit uh, coupling as Ian Spielman has done. You can engineer uh, your dispersion relation. Of course, the interactions are of utmost importance. You can have uh, attractive interaction, pairing leads to superfluidity and so forth. In a lattice, often the interaction can be repulsive and the repulsive interaction, on-site interaction leads uh, to mod insulating phases, the suppression of density fluctuations or uh, you, you can have in the even lower energy sector, you expect to have uh, antiferromagnetic ordering, an ordering of two, two components. And the last point is the trap and, well, usually we have harmonic traps. 
But now, and also in this, we will hear, I think, uh, in one of the next two talks, uh, well, you can have box potential. There are a lot of uh, progress on box potential. And also rings, uh, like uh, Gretchen Campbell uh, does uh, at NIST, and she does fantastic uh, work on mesoscopic-like devices or atomtronic type of systems. And in my talk, we will hear about a mesoscopic type system which consists of two reservoirs which are con connected by a tiny uh, channel. But let me uh, first start uh, with a lattice work. We start with a potassium-40 gas, a few hundred thousand uh, quantum degenerate potassium atoms which we load into an optical lattice uh, potential. And one of our key observables is the good old absorption imaging. We switch off the lattice, we switch it off slow enough so that we have a band mapping, and then we can observe whether we have atoms in the lowest band and here also in the higher band. And we can a little bit look into where are the atoms in, in, the, in the band, in the Brion zone. This will become uh, important. Um, now I would directly go into the band structure of a graphene. Graphene has, a, a, has two low energy bands which touch at a point due to an uh, accidental de uh, degeneracy, which is due to the uh, geometry, due to the symmetry of the lattice. At first we thought, well, this is all very nice, would be nice to have fermionic atoms in such a band structure, but look at these awful 120 degree angles. In our experiments, we have 90 degree angles for all lattice beams, and changing the angle um, in a running experiment can take three years or so. So that, that. at the same time, um, people were setting up experiments with bosons and doing a lot of fantastic work on, on level crossings, and uh, on Dirac points and on uh, honeycomb lattices and Kagome lattices. So we thought, but still, it would be nice to have that uh, with fermions. And actually, the situation was not too hopeless. Because at that time, we were setting up a kind of a flexible lattice uh, geometry. And the idea is that you overlay two lattice structure. So just imagine you have one optical lattice created by those two red beams, which have the same frequency, they give rise to this potential. And then you have a second lattice formed by the red beam plus the brown beam. This gives this potential. And now you can position them, you can change the intensity, and so forth. And this gives you a huge uh, variety of lattice potentials, and, and this is only part of it. You have diamond, diamond chains, you have triangular, and in particular also have a honeycomb lattice. A bit of a, a, a stretch graphene, um, but it uh, has the same uh, topology and has a band structure where you have the Dirac points a little bit moved into the Brion zones. And we are very thankful to Dario Poletti who pointed out to us that this brick lattice is the same topology-wise as the honeycomb lattice. But that's where the difficulty is started. Um, probing the Dirac point is not so trivial because you have a vanishing density of state and small energy scales. Basically, the, from experimental point of view, this, this means no signal and you have to measure infinitely long time. Um, and I will not give you an account of all the misery we went through, um, but only tell you uh, which method uh, worked. So what we did is we take the cloud of uh, fermionic atoms and accelerate them through the uh, band structure. And that way we avoid this vanishing density of state because many atoms will see the Dirac points. Okay, so what is happening in this variant kind of, of Bloch oscillations? Um, so this is the starting point in momentum space, our cloud. We apply this magnetic field gradient, and then we observe Bloch oscillation, just like Christoph Salomon did quite some time ago with ultra-cold atoms. If we see Bloch oscillation, if there's an energy gap, yet if the trajectory 
passes through a Dirac point, then after the Bloch oscillation, we will find the atoms in the higher band. So we can observe this. Here we see it after different time steps what the quasi-momentum distribution looks like. And now you see how the atoms here end up in uh, the higher band and how they are removed from the lower Brion zone. So we, this is one due to one Dirac point, this is due uh, to the other Dirac point. Now we have a system where we can change, we, we can produce the, the uh, graphene type of geometry, but we can now also play with the geometry. In particular, we can move the Dirac points in the Brion zone and we can make them vanish. So at some point, if we change our laser intensity, the Dirac points uh, move to the side and they vanish. And that we could observe. So here we have a situation with Dirac points and here they vanish and we don't see atoms in the higher bands anymore. Actually, we can measure a whole uh, phase diagram of the regions with and without Dirac points. And also by going through the Dirac points in different directions, at that point where they just are about to vanish, there is a linear crossing in one direction and a quadratic crossing or touching in the other direction. And from that we can conclude from the differences we observe uh, that we have in indeed in the one direction uh, a linear crossing. The flexibility of the lattice also allows you to break uh, the inversion symmetry, so just by moving one lattice with respect to the other, other a tiny bit, which is encoded in, the, in a frequency in our experiment. And this opens up a gap, and you effectively have then uh, Dirac fermions with a little mass. And now here, we have to be a bit careful. This picture of uh, the energy dispersion, just the energy in quasi-momentum, uh, that is too little to describe the whole system. Because if you would go once around uh, a Dirac, co uh, Dirac point, then you would, uh, uh, you get, you account uh, a berry phase of pi. And there's actually a very recent archive of uh, Uli Schneider and Emanuel Bloch uh, who look at uh, such a situation. More generally, if you now open up a gap, then the flux, the kind of this effective flux, moves into the Brion zone, and that is described uh, by a Berry curve, which is, which is just like a magnetic field. And this Berry curvature will change the motion of the atoms, or the semi-classic motion of the atoms in the, uh, in the band structure. For example, let's take the situation where we have just a bit opened the gap of the two Dirac points and look at the semi-classic motion. What we expect is that at one uh, Dirac point, the atoms will drift to the left if there is, uh, say, a positive uh, curvature. At the other one, which has, say, a negative curvature, the drift is in the other direction. Okay, so you could argue, well, in one point it goes a bit to the right, and the other it goes a bit to the left, that will not matter much. But you could also imagine a situation where you have two Dirac points with the same Berry curvature. Then it would always go uh, to the right, and that's very much like a Hall effect. And actually this situation um, had been looked at uh, by uh, Duncan Haldane, he looked in the, well, end of the 80s, he looked at a, a model system which gave him the quantum Hall effect without having a magnetic field. And the starting point of that is a honeycomb lattice, which has its inversion symmetry and time reversal symmetry. And now he broke the time reversal symmetry by introducing a a complex tunneling, next nearest neighbor tunneling, as is shown here. This breaks time reversal symmetry, and it opens up a gap. And it opens up a gap in such a way that you have, at both Dirac points, the same Berry curvature. 
So this is a, would correspond to a insulating state, but with a hole current. So it is a, called a topological churn insulator with the non-zero hole conductance. And then he played around with the interplay between inversion symmetry and uh, time reversal symmetry. And he obtained such a phase diagram here on the horizontal axis that is the breaking of the time reversal symmetry, which is encoded in the phase phi of this uh, complex tunnel coupling. And in the, in the vertical axis, that is the sublattice offset which correspond to breaking the inversion, the inversion symmetry. So let's have a bit closer look at this phase diagram. So this point here, that is uh, the typical situation of graphene. You have Dirac points and different Barry curvatures. Now you break inversion symmetry, you then, um, now, now the, the Barry curvature spreads out. So you have the different uh, Barry curvature and uh, open up a gap, so an insulator. However, if you break time reversal symmetry, then you have the same Barry curvature and an open gap. And you may wonder what is happening at that line here. That line describes the point where the gap closes on one side and then after that it opens again. So you have only at this line between a churn insulator and normal insulator, it's just one Dirac point briefly uh, touches. So, but the question was, of course, how to, to, to build that. It was more a theoretical concept and it was very influential also in the, uh, in, in, on the development of uh, topological uh, insulators. Um, there, there was one uh, proposal um, that was by Oka and Aoki and they uh, looked at the situation. What about having graphene and shining polarized light on it? And that would give rise to a circular motion of uh, the, the structure and would break time reversal symmetry. Of course, uh, well, we are not thinking of graphene, we will not change, but we, we, we think of uh, optical lattices. And there are methods that have been developed uh, how one can shake lattices just by putting uh, your mirrors on a piezo. Well, in our case, we also needed to make sure that the rest of the lattice structure will follow. And the breaking of the time reversal symmetry now corresponds to changing the relative phase at which we drive these piezos. If we drive them at the same, uh, with the same phase, then there's no time reversal symmetry broken. If they are 90 degree of phase, we maximally break time reversal symmetry and it, in an effective Hamiltonian, it corresponds to a next nearest neighbor's tunnel coupling. So then we can create the band structure for a trivial band insulator and a churn insulator. And uh, we can now see how can we measure the Berry curvature in uh, these two situations. So the idea is the following. We accelerate the atoms through the band structure and we observe the drift, the transverse drift in, 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 in the Brion zone. And we do that also for accelerating them in the opposite direction. And in the case of uh, the, the normal band insulator, we would expect that it cancels while here in the other situation, we would the difference between going up and going down should give a fairly visible signal. So that, these are the results. The upper case describes uh, the breaking of the inversion symmetry only, and the difference in the drift is small, whilst if we break uh, the uh, time reversal symmetry, to 90 degree, we see a large difference in the drift for the two cases. You may, and we can also make a plot with the two axes uh, being the time reversal symmetry or the phase and the inversion symmetry and can see how 
the Berry curvature affects uh, the drift. You may now ask, ah, since you can measure the presence of a Dirac point, maybe you can map out uh, the line in the phase diagram there. Because at that point, a Dirac point closes. And we had measured the presence of Dirac points. And indeed, uh, we can do that. So what we do is we send our cloud again through the Dirac point, and then we can look at how many atoms went through the lower Dirac point or went up in the higher band and in the lower Dirac point and how many in the, higher, in the other Dirac point. And we could measure that as a function, say, of inversion symmetry. And that corresponds then to a line here in the diagram. And with time reversal symmetry present, we see our maximum transfer is at exactly for exactly, uh, at ex exactly the same point of inverse, so when we have per perfect inversion symmetry. It is different, though, when if we go to broken inversion symmetry, there we get, for the upper Dirac point, we get maximum at a certain given uh, offset, and just the opposite for the lower Dirac point. And this way, we could determine the phase diagram with fairly good agreement uh, with a calculated uh, phase diagram. Now you may ask, uh, what about interactions? Well, I also asked a lot of theorists, what about interactions? They say little is known. At some stage, you would, of course, expect that you have, say, some... Um, uh, churn insulator and you increase interaction and you would somewhere end up at a mod insulator. But, but how that's happening, as far as I understand, is little is known. Um, on the other hand, but experimentally, we looked at a situation by producing uh, planes of Haldane models, coupled planes, and switched on interaction, and we did not see enormous heating. So we did not see a lot of increase in heating compared to a situation that we do not shake. The lattice. So th this makes us fairly optimistic. Concerning the very low energy sector, of course, that is still difficult. I mean, we are, in a sense, optimistic because we could see in 1D uh, uh, Hubbard chains that there are antiferromagnetic correlations, but uh, we will see how that will proceed. Um, but what about uh, edge currents? Uh, there should be edge currents if you have a uh, have a, uh, a quantum Hall state. Um, this is still some way to go, but I will talk in a moment about quantized currents, but in a different setting. Before that, I would like to thank uh, the Lattice uh, team. It's a fantastic uh, team. Um, the present postdocs are Daniel Greif, uh, who also did his PhD on the experiment, and Remy de Bucois, and Letizia uh, Taruel uh, was for a long time on working as a postdoc on that experiment and is now at ICFO in Barcelona. So let's come to the transport of atoms, the transport between two terminals. So the situation is we consider a reservoir with a higher chemical potential and a reservoir with a lower chemical potential and that means we expect a current going from the higher to the lower chemical potential, and we could characterize our channel through which the current get, goes uh, by a certain conductance G, which is one over a resistance. So we could now ask the question, ah, okay, if we make the channel smaller and smaller and smaller, at some point there shouldn't be a current anymore, but what is happening when we make that smaller and smaller? And this question, actually, the mesoscopic people have asked themselves in the late 80s. They looked at, they were able to produce highly ballistic two-dimensional electron gases, at least ballistic enough to just cross uh, a little uh, a channel. That is shown here. So this is one chemical potential, and here the other, or you have a different bias in that case. And by applying a voltage here, you can make this channel smaller. And what they had observed was that you see at very small gate, there's no current, and then it goes, increases stepwise. And the steps are given uh, by Planck's constant. So the resistivity changes in steps. 
So why is that so? Let's look at this general situation. You have a left reservoir and a right reservoir and a constriction so that you have, which is tight, so that you have to, to consider the transverse degree of freedoms as quantized. And these are shown here. And now, let's assume you're sitting on this energy level and then think how your potential energy uh, changes when you go into the reservoirs. It will decrease since uh, the zero point energy will decrease. Okay, so that is this red line in energy space. And same for the next higher um, channel, transverse channel. Okay, so we now consider a situation where the largest energy scale is smaller than the second, uh, the second channel. Okay, so we can remove that. We have a, we can, we, it's now sufficient to just consider one channel. Only all energies are small compared to the higher transfer excitation. Okay, and now we can calculate the current. And we calculate the current simply by considering only the right moving atoms above the right chemical potential. So we take T equals zero, okay? The other ones, they will just be equal, equal each other, okay? And then to calculate the current, we calculate the velocity times the density. That will give us a current, okay? So let's do that. For this, we need to know the density of states, and we need to fit in one fermion per, per state, and we integrate of the energy between mu r and mu l, and this is just the delta. And we assume that the transmission, that each atom which enters the channel will also end up at the other reservoir, okay? So we put that into the equation, velocity and density of state, and then we calculate, we get out that uh, the, the current is just the uh, chemical potential difference divided by h, h as Planck's. Uh, constant. The H comes in through Pauli principle, the fact that there are steps that is given by the mode structure. Okay? And you, then from this you get the conductance is 1 over H. And you can do that, of course, in multi-mode and finite temperature. That is a typical uh, landau wittiger theory. Okay, what about quantized conductance in neutral uh, Matter, it has actually not uh, been seen. There had been a proposal by Ty Wiesen uh, in the late 90s, and also the helium people, uh, they tried uh, to, to see that. So what is actually necessary? You need, one thing is you need a, me a method to measure the conductance. You need a ballistic channel, so no backscattering, that T equals one. You need a quantum degenerate Fermi gas. And you need to be able to resolve individual conduction channels. And you need to be in the adiabatic regime, which means that you don't have a, a backscattering. And you need somehow the applicability of the Landau theory. And we are in a very different regime than the electrons because in our case, actually, the, the mean free pass is larger than the whole system size. And most importantly, <laughs> you need a team. And uh, this team uh, is a wonderful team, and it's led by Jean-Philippe uh, Pontu. And you need an experiment, and that's... Uh, uh, lithium machine where we have extremely good optical access. We have two uh, ultra high resolution microscopes. And we produce elongated lithium clouds and shine in from the side a TM01 beam which separates the gas into two reservoirs, left reservoir and right re reservoir, and they are connected by a two dimensional uh, channel. So here it's a two-dimensional multi-mode channel at this point. And we can produce now clouds such that we have more atoms on the left than on the right. Okay, so that's what our Fermi battery or Fermi capacitor looks like. More atom on one side than on the other side. And then what is happening if we watch it over time, then you see that the imbalance in atom number, that that exponentially decreases, which is actually kind of what 
you would expect. And from such curves, we can extract, of course, the time decay constant. And the decay constant, that tells us what is the conductance, because we know we can calculate the compressibility of the system since it's a weakly interacting uh, Fermi gas. This is a situation very similar to discharging a capacitor over a resistor. So where does actually the resistance come from? We have all this, we take a lot of care to make nice uh, laser beams. So how should there be some resistance? Actually what the situation, how to look at it is that some atoms will not make it into the channel, kind of reflect it at the entrance. Other ones, they will make it into the channel and once they are in the channel, they will not be reflected back, then you have the situation of a ballistic channel. And it also means if they are not reflected back in the channel, that means the density will be constant along the channel. And that's what we actually could measure. So we measure by in situ imaging the density along the channel during the transport and we could see uh, that we have a flat uh, situation in the channel which, from which we could conclude, yes, it behaves like a, a ballistic conductor. Well, then we thought, oh, maybe we can go down to a single channel. And um, we thought, oh, maybe we can narrow down our two-dimensional channel and then have a little kind of almost point contact and then it expands into the other uh, reservoir. On the other hand, our worries were, okay, we need very low temperatures. We need temperatures so that they are small compared to the transverse oscillation frequencies in the channel, similar to, to 1D atomic gases, this criterion. And then if you calculate, the, typically you have 10 atoms in the channel, so not a huge current. Um, okay, anyway, we move forward. We have these nice microscopes and thought uh, maybe we can use them to project the channel. And that's, that's actually what we do. We just take a mask with a line and shine a green laser beam on it and carefully align it so that we have uh, the mask is projected onto the two-dimensional channel that is shown here. So we project down. And there's another red laser beam, and I will tell you in a minute what this red laser beam, uh, what the role is. Okay, so this is now an in situ image of uh, the quantum point contact. So here you see the length scale, that's 10 micrometer compared to a Fermi wavelength of 2.2 uh, micrometer. And we can also image our projected beam, that is this green beam here. And this red dashed line, that is what we call a gate beam that adds an attractive potential in the region of uh, the quantum point contact, kind of counterbalancing the uh, zero point energy, because otherwise the zero point energy would be just dramatically high. So with this we can control uh, the zero point uh, energy at the center of the trap. Okay, and you get uh, such uh, potential curve, so that is for the lowest channel, and that is the calculation for next higher and even higher channel. But we can move these energies up and down with this red beam. And then uh, we started measuring in which regime are we, so we measured uh, the transverse frequency with our new uh, projected beam. Actually, we got 31 uh, kilohertz, so quite stiff trap, so we were happy. In the uh, two-dimensional direction, we have 10 kilohertz or in another run, eight uh, kilohertz. And this is to be compared to the temperature in, in a trap, which we expanded to get lower temperatures, um, which is 35 nanokelvin and compared this, the, this trap frequency see, would compare to 500 nanokelvin. So kind of, well, we, we, we were optimistic. Then the question was, of course, the atom number. And what we did for this, we, we simply waited a long time. We waited 1.5 seconds so that quite a number of atoms could 
uh, could move from one side to the other side. And of course, since you measure both sides, total number, atom number fluctuation, they fall up. And then we measure from the number of atoms that, uh, that uh, the number, how the number of, uh, the atom number difference decays, we get this time constant. And we know, or we can calculate our compressibility, and then we can get an absolute value as a conductor and that we can plot on the vertical axis. And that was the result of the measurement. So here on the horizontal axis, that is a change in the gate potential uh, in units of uh, the set uh, frequency. And here you can see that it takes steps, very nice first step, and appreciably nice uh, second uh, plateau. Then we were more optimistic, we went uh, uh, to higher gate potentials. Higher gate potential means that we can more channels, channels come in and we could observe these curves which kind of for higher gate potential seem to deviate a bit from, uh, from what we observed uh, from, from the theory. And then we thought, okay, let's have a look uh, at where we get good agreement at gate potential of one microkelvin and change the transverse confinement very much like what they did in the, um, in the mesoscopic physics. And these are the measurements here, so that's a change of transverse confinement and you see here a very good agreement up to the second uh, step. Another aspect is that if you have a ballistic conductor, a one-dimensional conductor, it will not, the resistivity will not depend on the length of the system. So if you have a longer quantum point conductor, if it's still a quantum wire, if it's still um, uh, ballistic, uh, the resistivity should not, uh, should not change. So what we did is we created longer quantum wires, and again, we were able uh, to see uh, quantized steps, so in accordance uh, with the expectation. So with this, I would like uh, to conclude here. So we were able to see ballistic and adiabatic channels can be produced. Um, we have a different situation to the mesoscopic physics since we have isolated systems. So it's completely, the total system is completely isolated. And we are in an ultra-ballistic uh, regime where the mean free pass is larger than the total system. We have tunable interactions. And actually we could see also this quantized conductance for a situation where we have practically zero uh, scattering length. We are, of course, thinking about looking at it with uh, strong interactions and uh, looking at spin transport in such situations. We're not so hard looking into precision measurements of age. Of course, one could now very easily take this system or the quantum, the, the, the topological uh, Hall insulator and connect reservoirs at the right point and measure uh, the whole conductivity, but I'm, I think that's still uh, some time off until one can do this type of experiments. And with this, I would like uh, to thank uh, the whole team uh, in Zürich. It's, it's real, a real pleasure to work with each of them. It's a great team, and I have not talked about experiments on BC and cavity um, and Raphael model, will have uh, a poster on it, and there we have recently uh, looked at the dynamic structure factor in a uh, long-range interacting uh, system. And Julian Leonard will present uh, a poster on an experiment where we can move the atoms uh, from one region to another with electrically tunable lenses, so which makes uh, all the moving and shaping of potentials of, of, for atoms uh, fairly simple. So I invite you to come to those two posters and with this I would like to thank you for your attention.
So thank you for this very interesting talk. Uh, now it's time for discussion. I'm sure there are plenty of questions, so there is one here. Hi. Uh, when you're using a mask to create a shadow to, for the channel preparation, how are, what are you doing about the diffraction of the light and how is it affecting the channel? Okay, that is a nice thing about having a 2D channel. Mm -hmm. Because in the 2D channel, I just need the image in the plane of the 2D channel. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so easy. The, the other direction of the 2D channel, there we need a, a holographic faceplate to create the 2D channel in the first place. But once we have it, then we can just project like here okay. and it will be sharp okay. in the region. I had, I had one question here. So uh, you explained this quantized conductance with a fermionic atom, and now if you replace this with a bosonic atom, then what will happen? Do you see the similarity yeah. or any difference? Bosonic atom, yes. There I was, a, I got actually a bit annoyed with the literature on quantized conductance by the very people who, who well, founded the field. They, at some stage, they said, ah, now one can also see it with photons. And there were some steps in some conductance of the photons. But the difference is, and, and the steps, they come from the mode structure. But the step height, the, the H, that comes from the Pauli principle. So, in, yeah, that was my conclusion from going through the literature. And I think it's correct. <laughs> so, there's a question there. Uh, how to transform the topological uh, superfluid uh, topological insulate and the Magellanic Fermion in optical lattice in real experiment? You know, uh, in your talk, you uh, describe the graphene, uh, you know, the dilatar Fermion and the spin orbit coupling. And the topological, I mean, says maybe we can use the total atom system, maybe total atom plus cavity plus optical lattice to measure the topological superfluid, topological insulate, and uh, Magellanic Fermia. Uh, yes, in the long run, that's surely something I guess one can do, but in the short run, I, I think to have even in the Hubbard regime a nice good um, uh, superfluid from an experimental point of view um, would be <laughs> would be nice. So, so there is still some work and some hurdles to be overcome. Even though the tools are there, but you cannot get them uh, together. And there is, of course, a lot of uh, literature. Also, I mean, I, I just see Majek uh, here who looked at uh, people who looked at these. Uh, questions, and they are very interesting, I think. Um, I have a question about the experimental parameters in the, in the, in the, in the, exper in the system. Um, in the mesoscopic systems, you have to make sure that the, the degeneracy of the contacts um, is small compared to KT and the bias, so that you can actually see the, the quantization when, when you normalize the conductance. <laughs> So what is your, but in your system, there is very little thermalization because it's ultra ballistic regime. Uh, so can you comment on the uh, Fermi energy, KT, and the bias, the energy scales for that? Um, we have, the, 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 we, we can go, of course, to a regime where the bias is small. There is a slight, one can also go to a regime where you have um, uh, the, the, uh, one of the chemical potentials below. Uh, the lowest energy. Um, and if you calculate, I mean, the curves that we went through, uh, we put through, these are uh, the completely calculated curves, uh, including the chemical potentials on both uh, sides. The question, so, so the regime-wise, it, uh, it is easy, to, well, easy to get in. The 
uh, other questions on the thermalization, I think what our experiments have shown, in particular when we went to zero scattering length, is that a part, I mean, a part of what is happening is that the atoms go through the channel, but they will not come back. And that can be simply due to the fact you do not have a perfect harmonic oscillator anymore. They have a complicated uh, trajectory. And the likelihood, even though it will take them some time to thermalize finally in the reservoir, they will not uh, go back. Whether you can create situations where they can actually go back, um, I will not give a final answer to that. Uh, but it seems in the experimental situation that we have, uh, they will not go back and uh, the thermalization final we will take place before that can happen. Okay, okay. sorry, it's, it's time I to close. Have a question. No, no, it's, it's time to close the discussion, sorry. Uh, so let's thank Tillman.